Our gospel this morning comes to us from uh, St. Mark, chapter 1, beginning at verse 14. Glory to you, O Lord. The calling of the first disciples. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you from God the Father, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Here's a guy you've never heard of, Cyril Evans. Cyril Evans was a telegraph operator on the SS Californian. This ship was crossing the North Atlantic in April of 1912 and was encountering an unusual number of large icebergs. The captain and his ship had stopped sailing for the night. That captain then ordered Cyril Evans to send a radio warning to ships in the area to alert them of these unusually large icebergs. His message was sent successfully, but because one of the ships in the area was very nearby the Californian, the volume received from the Californian was blasting the ears of the communication operator on the ship called the Titanic. Irritated by that loud noise and burdened by the number of backlog messages he was trying to send to the United States by the guests of that ship, the Titanic's operator neglected to relay the message to the bridge of his ship. The captain of the Titanic never received the warning about the icebergs. Cyril Evans followed his order He sent the message, and then he retired for the night. His work was done. But the fair warning, the fair warning went unheeded, sending the Titanic headlong into one of those icebergs that was peering just above the surface of the water, which killed 1,500 people. That unheeded fair warning also allowed Hollywood to create a mildly successful film that grossed that grossed $2.2 billion. I think the 1,500 people who perished in the sinking of the Titanic would rather have had the captain heed the warning. You have all been warned. I'm sure you have encountered situations in life when a fair warning would have been helpful, maybe even life-changing. I find it interesting that even with the knowledge provided by a fair warning, we still have a tendency to march forward anyway. Those warnings almost serve as a challenge, sometimes as a temptation to us, like a sign that says wet paint. What is our, what is our tendency? What is our inclination? Oh, by golly, that paint is wet. The Bible story about Jonah is a short four-chapter read. Our Sunday school recollection of his adventure usually starts and ends with a three-day journey inside a big fish. We were always told that it was a whale, which makes breathable sense, but there's much more to Jonah's reluctant trip to Nineveh. Our text began at chapter 3, but I would like to give you a quick review, and I do promise quick, a review of chapters 1 and 2. God tells Jonah, go to Nineveh. Jonah disobediently thinks for himself and boards a ship for Tarshish, which is the opposite direction of Nineveh. Jonah buys a ticket on the SS Disobedience. I came up with that name. And he is at sea with this crew, and he's tucked inside the bowels of this vessel. God sees everything 
in this world, including Jonah hiding below deck. And the Lord sends a mighty tempest to toss the ship topsy-turvy. There's a back and forth between Jonah and the crew about why is all of this happening? Jonah fesses up to his disobedience and tells the boys, toss me overboard and the sea will calm down. And they do that. And sure enough, the storm stops. Jonah is then rescued by a big mouth whale and is locked inside, undigested, for three days and for three nights. Don't miss that detail. While he's sailing the sea in the belly of this whale, he prays a beautiful, heartfelt, and repentant prayer to God. And God orders the fish to expel his lunch. On the beach, Jonah is stunned, he's slimed, and he's subdued. Jonah hears from God again. This time, he obeys. Wouldn't you? God says, Jonah, I told you before, I'm going to tell you again. Tell the Ninevites this. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's it. No 20-minute sermon. Just eight words of fair warning. And these Ninevites are converted immediately. They believed God. They fasted. They swapped their clothing for this burlap-like sackcloth. And then they sat in ashes. Ashes. Part of the repentance we will repeat on Ash Wednesday. The fair warning reaches the ears of the king, the king of of Nineveh. And he orders the entire nation, its people, and their livestock to be covered in sackcloth. He orders all of his subjects to call on Jonah's God and to give up their evil ways and their violent lives. Who knows, the king says, God may relent and turn from his fierce anger toward us. God saw, God heard the change in their hearts and in their minds and did not bring destruction upon these people as he had warned, at least he did not for this generation. Jonah was not pleased at all with the grace and the mercy that had been shown the Ninevites. He was rather ticked off. That is chapter 4, to read on your own. That's what we call a cliffhanger. Fair warning. That's also what Jesus was sharing with the people of Galilee. This is from our text from Mark. Mark does not go into great detail about much of anything. He is brief. He is to the point. He says, Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan River. And as he ascended from the water, he saw heaven open up, being torn open, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. The voice of God, the same voice that Jonah heard, said of Jesus, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And then Mark tells us, this is how brief Mark is. He tells us, Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. That's it. The other Gospels thankfully go into a little greater detail. Mark was a man of very few details. So Jesus goes to Galilee and he preaches this 16-word sermon to all who could hear. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. And then Jesus calls his first disciples with one sentence. Come, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. These words are so powerful, the men immediately drop their nets. They leave the keys to their boat, and they walk along the beach until they run into James and John. And then James and John leave more than their nets. They leave their dad and all of their servants behind to follow this man, this strange man with very captivating words. Pastors and and preachers and guys like me toil over keyboards. We toil over pen and paper to write eloquent and persuasive words to stir the hearts of those gathered on any typical Sunday morning. Yet, Jonah and Jesus just use a sentence or two to give fair warning. I'm always concerned whether I'm being too bold or too boring with the Word of God. Jonah didn't even have to write his own sermon. 
God provided the word and the warning to him to share to Nineveh. Jesus, of course, is God. So he didn't have to wait for a ship. He didn't have to wait for a storm or for a whale to listen to God. He just told the truth. He told the truth with just enough words to make sure everyone knew exactly what he was saying. The fair warning from both Jonah and Jesus was simple, and I would say impossible not to understand. So I ask you this, why are our churches half empty? Why are the schools filled with children who are sleeping in on Sunday? I'm not talking about all children, obviously. But the numbers are significant, and we've been ignoring this for a very long time. A Christian research company called Lifeway Research reports that while 50% of U.S. adults say they attended church weekly as children, only 22% continue church attendance at that same rate today. It went from 50 to 22% in only a generation or two. What do you think will happen to the lovely children these folks are raising? It's an erosion that can be attributed to, to many factors, but I think one of the main reasons is that the church no longer believes a fair warning is necessary in today's world. I think that there is a clear, apathetic attitude toward church attendance, toward Christianity as a whole, and clearly toward evangelism. I want you to know, I sound very judgmental, but I want you also to know that this comes from my heart, a heart of concern, not of judgment. We need to love these people into church, not condemn them. So, we always look for who to blame. Is it the leadership of our government? Is it the leadership of our church and its seminaries? Is it our pastors? Is it our parents? Is it me? Is it you? Who's the villain? We always want someone riding into town with a black hat so we know who's to blame. There's no one with a black hat. I think what we tend to do, I say I think way too often, what we tend to do is forget that there is a spiritual war going on, as there has always been. A spiritual war between God and that fallen angel named Satan, an angel we don't speak of very often in our, in our sanctuaries. That battle extends to those who follow Jesus, and it extends to those who ignore him. The ignorance stems from a lie, a lie that has been perpetrated on humanity since the scene described in Genesis chapter 3 where the serpent said to Eve, did God really say? If we can doubt, if we can doubt what God said, we can doubt whether he really is. Jonah gave fair warning about a pending collision with an iceberg named the wrath of God. He warned, he warned these people and did so reluctantly, but he did warn them. And the people of Nineveh were spared. Jesus gave fair warning that the kingdom of God is drawing near. And if we don't feel that now, we've got to test our nerves. Now, while Jesus' warning was worded differently, it is the same warning that Jonah gave. Time is short. Who are you heeding? Who are you listening to? Are we going to live for our sinful desires and our sinful selves? Or are we going to follow Jesus Christ to his cross? His journey to the cross was not an easy one. It involved a kangaroo court trial that sentenced him to death. The journey involved beatings. It involved bloodletting, whips, and spit. The journey involved a heavy wooden cross that would be erected on a hill with Jesus nailed to it with spikes. The journey, all of those Romans and the Jews thought, 
would seemingly end with a dead martyr on the cross and a world with no recollection of his existence. That did not happen. That ship called Jesus did not sink. The body of Jesus, the flesh and blood of Jesus, did go into a grave, but here is the best news ever, and I do mean ever. His body did not remain there. He walked out. Not only did he walk out, he ate, he drank, he talked, he taught, and most importantly, he promised you the same resurrection experience when your time comes to an end. And it will, and so will mine. His promise of that resurrection experience is promised for those who believe. Scripture makes it clear. That urgent message, that fair warning is consistent throughout all of Scripture, through God's inerrant word. Repent, believe, and experience his good news. Jesus is alive. He is alive in you. Thanks be to God. Amen. I warned you about the prayers. Uh, let's go to the Lord uh, in the prayers of the church. Uh, all based on Psalm 62, which was read earlier in this very sanctuary. Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from Him. Truly He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Lord God, you say it because it's true. Outside of a faith in you and your Son, Jesus Christ, there is no hope for eternal life with you. Let us rest in that promise and in your daily presence and provision in our lives. Thank you for calling us to worship this morning. Thank you for giving us your word to lead us through the challenges of life and to recognize the joy we are given through this beautiful mystery called life. Help us to never take a single day for granted. You are our firm foundation. You are our rock and our shelter. Thank you for this holy day of Sabbath. Call others into your glory through it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. How long will you assault me? Would all of you throw me down this leaning wall, this tottering fence? Lord of strength, we have a great tendency to let our circumstances define us. Help us to realize we are defined by you and the love you have for us. All of us reel and suffer to some degree from viruses, injured bodies, cancer cells, depression, loneliness, the heartache of loss, and the exhaustion of life. We pray you will kill the viruses and kill those cancer cells and ask you, Lord, to please heal the broken bones and to mend our physical wounds. Bring your light into the darkness of our depression and send friendship and company to help our loneliness subside. We pray our hope in you will diminish our mourning, and we ask for energy and strength when our muscles and our minds ache from the burdens we experience as we journey through this life. Lord, many, many connected to this church suffer from one or more of these maladies. Watch over them and grace these people with your healing and comfort. We pray specifically for Bonnie Bieber, Mary Jo Gimble, Mitzi Eberhard Ringard, Kayla Setschge, B. Shelsky, Nicholas Fisher, Denise Williams, or Wilman, and Rudy Yerke. And I pray for my friend Kurt Johnson as he continues his cancer treatments. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we are concerned about your church. Not concerned about what you are doing with it, but what we are doing to it. Bring us clarity and purpose as to the direction you would have us go as followers of Jesus Christ. Where there is doubt, bring revelation. Where there are lies, bring truth. Where there is evil and darkness in this world, shine the blinding light of righteousness on it, available only through Jesus Christ. 
We pray for Zion Lutheran and all churches that preach and teach biblical truths and the exclusivity of salvation through Christ alone. Send Zion a shepherd, a man or a woman who longs to proclaim your word and will support this congregation in good times and in bad. Thank you for sending your servant Larry Yerke to serve these past few years. Bless him. Bless him with good health and peace as he continues to serve here and at other churches in his retirement years. We thank you, Father, for the diligent work of our church council here and the call committee at Zion. Produce fruit by their efforts. Lord, make our unchurched or doubtful friends and neighbors curious about Jesus Christ and his promises. Guide them and their families to Zion or to another church where they can, where they can become part of the body of Christ, your church. Spark a longing for faith and knowledge in the hearts and minds of our young people. Please, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Power belongs to you, God, and with you, Lord, is unfailing love. You reward everyone according to what they have done. Father and Savior, it isn't what we have done or have not done. It is about what Jesus did for us when he sacrificed his life on the cross. But what we do does matter. May all our actions reflect the love we have for you, and may our actions and words be a prompt to others that will draw them to want to know you. All of creation speaks to your power. How we are pardoned for our sin speaks to the power of your Son's blood shed for every believer who professes Jesus Christ as Lord. Guide this country, Lord, in the spirit in which it was formed, one nation under God, indivisible. Bring peace and civility to our election process. And may your will be done through every leader that is serving now and those who will serve as a result of the next election. We love you, Father, and we pray your blessing on each one of us as we wake to each new day. Watch over us, guide us, call us to serve one another, in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray now with the words Jesus used to teach his disciples, our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And friends, receive this blessing and benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and bring you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.